In part two of the integumentary system, we'll be focusing on the anatomy and physiology of the epidermis. So if you recall from part one of our presentation, we had said that the epidermis was made of cells known as the epithelium. So we want to build on that a little bit today. In actuality, there's many cells there. So they're actually in layers. And if you were to look at these cells, they're act they're, they're, they appear flat. So we call the types of cells that make up the epidermis stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified means that they're in layers and squamous means that the cells appear flat. Now this epidermis is avascular. What that means is there's no direct blood supply going to the epithelial cells. This is a characteristic of epithelial uh, epithelium. But here's the problem. These, uh, some of the cells that are in the lower part of the epidermis are living cells. So living cells require oxygen, they require nutrients, right? They have to get rid of waste products. So how do they do it? Here's the answer. If you take a look, again, we follow this blue squiggly line over here. Right, this everything above is the epidermis. If you notice, there's no blood vessels anywhere in here, right? So where are the blood vessels? In the upper part of the dermis, right over here, let's say, all oh, this in here, these are very small blood vessels. They'll bring oxygen and nutrients, and those substances will diffuse up into the epidermis, and then waste products will diffuse back down. And so even though the epidermis doesn't have a direct blood supply, they are getting their nutrients and getting rid of waste products from blood vessels in the upper part of the dermis. This was the picture from the Martini book. And if you take a look at Tortora, same type of thing. You can see the blood vessels in the upper part of the dermis. Right Here's all the epidermis. Notice again, guys, no blood vessels up over here. No blood vessels. So oxygen will diffuse up into here waste products will diffuse back down this way. All right, so, so just to finish up this note, right, nutrients and oxygen diffuse from the capillaries in the dermis. And if you just want to add, waste products diffuse out of the epidermis. Right, waste products diffuse out of the epidermis. Now, all these cells that make up the epidermis are known as carotenocytes. So they, um, this is the most abundant epithelial cell. The reason they call them carotenocytes, you can probably guess from the name, they're filled with that water-resistant protein that we mentioned in part one called keratin. Right, so most of the cells in the epidermis are carotenocytes. We'll see some other cells I'll describe shortly. Now, not all skin in our body is the same. Most of the skin that covers the majority of our body is considered thin skin, and it has four distinct layers of keratinocytes. But the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet, they contain an extra layer of keratinocytes, so the skin is going to be thicker. So I want you to do this for a second. Take your left hand and just kind of touch or palpate the skin on the front of your right forearm. Just kind of feel it very, very gently. You're going to feel the skin has a certain thickness. Now work down towards your wrist and go on to your palm. And you'll notice now that the palm feels that it's like a thicker skin. The reason for that is it has that fifth layer of keratinocytes. So let's define these different layers. There's five different strata. Again, strata just means layers of keratinocytes in thick skin. The layers go as follow. The stratum basale is going to be the deepest layer. You can see I put there in parentheses. Some people call it the stratum germinativum. The next layer that's more superficial is the stratum spinosum. The next layer above that, stratum granulosum. The next layer above that, stratum lucidum. And finally, the most superficial layer is the stratum corneum.
All right, so we're going to take a look at each one of these layers and go over distinct features. Here's a picture from Martini book where they are actually showing the layers. We're going to go back to this uh, again a little bit later. I'll just show you real quickly. But down over here would be the stratum basale. Then all these cells here are going to be the stratum spinosum. This darker area here is stratum granulosum. Right above it, you can see a little clear area here, and a little clear area here is a stratum lucidum. And then finally, the thickest layer, all these layers of cells here, is the stratum corneum. Like I said, we're going to go back to that picture. Don't get too concerned if you don't understand it yet. This is the picture from Tortora. They actually do a really good job with this. This is one of my favorite pictures. You can see here stratum basale cells. Then all these cells here, stratum spinosum. Then this, the grainy layer here, granulosum. You can see these little speckles in there. Those are kind of granules. So this is the stratum granulosum. Stratum lucidum. Lucid means clear. So you can see the cells look clear. And then finally, the, high, uh, the thickest portion is going to be the stratum corneum. So again, we'll go back over these two pictures uh, once we done, we're done describing the actual layers. So let's take a look at the deepest layer first. This is known as the stratum basale. And again, you could also call it the stratum germinativum. Basale means basal, like basement. So this is going to be the bottom layer. Now, these cells are actually attached to a protein floor called the basement membrane. And what attaches the cell to the basement membrane, if you just want to highlight this word here, are hemi desmosomes. Right, so their job is to attach the cells to the protein floor. If we didn't have those hemidesmosomes, our skin would pull away from our body. So this stratum basale is forming a nice strong bond between the epidermis above and the dermis below. So I wanted to define a, a part of the epidermis which I've been calling kind of a squiggly line. Let's go to the martini picture first. Take a look here. I follow this blue squiggly line here. See how it goes down right here and then it goes up and then it goes down again and then it goes up. These downward projections of the stratum basale are known as epidermal ridges. Right? So all of these little downward projections here, 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 here's one. Here's a good one, right? You can see this one going down. Here's another good one. These are the epidermal ridges. Here's what they look like in the Tortora book. Again, you can see this downward projection here, this downward projection here, this downward projection. <coughs> Excuse me. These epidermal ridges actually form in our palms, our fingerprints, right? These epidermal ridges are all over the body on, in the skin, but they're deeper in the hands, and that's one of the reasons we can have uh, fingerprints. Now, so if the epidermal ridges are these downward projections here, the upward projection of the dermis in between the epidermal ridges is our next definition. These are known as the dermal papilla. So this upward projection right here, go to the Martini book, right? This upward projection right here, this upward projection right here is the dermal papilla. And that's right over here. Dermal means that it's in the dermis. Papilla is a great word if you just want to jot this down. Whenever you hear the word papilla, think mound-like. It's kind of forming like a little mountain or a mound. Um, so that would be the dermal papilla. We're going to see that word a lot in anatomy and physiology. Here's a good picture from, uh, I like this one from the Martini book. So this downward projection is an epidermal ridge, right? Epidermal ridge going down. And then you can see going up in between, this is a dermal papilla here. Here's a dermal papilla here, right? Here's a dermal papilla. Right? You can see they kind of interlock with one another. And then here we could see the epidermal ridges all in here, all these ridges here, they're forming our fingerprints. Right? So like I said, epidermal ridges are all over the skin, but they're more uh, pronounced in the hands. And this is the reason we have uh, fingerprints. 
Now, there's two specialized structures in the stratum basale that we need to know. Um, actually, let me go back for one second. I just want to make sure we finish the slide. Uh, so we have the epidermal ridges. We have the dermal papilla. The cell that f the cells that actually form the stratum basale are known as basal cells. They're not keratinocytes that we had mentioned a couple uh, minutes ago. These are known as basal cells. Some people call them germinative cells. The reason for that is these are stem cells. These cells continually divide. Uh, throughout the, the day, we actually slough off superficial cells from our skin. Listen to this, we lose about 30,000 to 40,000 skin cells per minute. They estimate that uh, over the course of a year, we lose about nine pounds of skin cells. So we need to replace those cells. So the cells in the basal area here, all these cells in here, they're continually dividing and making new cells that we that we slough off, right? So that's why they call them stem, stem cells. They're continually replacing the superficial keratinocytes that are sloughing off throughout the day. Now, there are two specialized structures in the stratum basale that we want to take a look at. The first one is known as a tactile disc. This is our first introduction to the nervous system in the skin. In the stratum basale, we have these tactile cells. They used to call them Merkel cells uh, that have these different sensory and nerve endings. They're, they respond to touch. Now we find them in hairless skin such as the your fingers and your palms. So when you go to touch something very, very gently, it's these tactile discs that are actually sending a signal to the brain to let the brain know what you're touching. All right, so this is something that we find in the stratum basale. The other cell that we find in the stratum basale are the melanocytes. These are the cells that produce a pigment called melanin. And if you recall from our first part of this presentation, melanin is the pigment that protects us from the ultraviolet radiation. The second layer of cells is called the stratum spinosum. Spinosum means spiny layer. So let's talk about why they look spiny. When the histologist would prepare a slide of the skin, they would put different chemicals on it so that we could see the skin cells underneath the microscope. They found that the cells in the stratum spinosum actually kind of shrank, right? the, the, the cytoplasm shrunk a little bit, and it gave the cell kind of a pincushion appearance. So it had a spiny appearance. In real life, the cells don't look spiny. It's only because of chemical processing. But nonetheless, the stratum spinosum is eight to ten layers now of keratinocytes. So you're not going to call them basal cells. That's only going to be in the basement, uh, the basal strata. Here, you're going to call them keratinocytes. These keratinocytes are attached to one another by a specialized kind of junction. If you just want to highlight this word, known as the desmosome. So the desmosomes hold the keratinocytes together so that they stay closely connected. We actually know this already. Think about this. If you had a sunburn, a couple days later, maybe you look at your shoulder and see that your skin is starting to peel. So if you were to grab a piece of skin and peel it, it comes off as a sheet, right? You don't, they doesn't come off as individual cells. It comes off as a sheet. The reason for that is the cells, these keratinocytes, are held together by these desmosomes. The second dot we explained already, these cells appear spiny because of the chemical processing. Now, what's interesting, these cells, just like the stratum basale cells, also divide. So these cells are also making new cells, just like the basal cells. There's one specialized cell that's inside the stratum spinosum known as the 
dendritic cell. They used to call it the Langerhans cell. You do hear it from time to time. But these dendritic cells are, are the important cells because they, and they activate an immune response. If something gets into the skin, let's say a splinter or a bacteria, these are the cells that are going to activate the immune response to take care of the problem. All right, so this is the stratum spinosum. The third layer is the stratum granulosum. Right? This is the granular layer. It's going to look kind of grainy. This is three to five layers of keratinocytes. Um, they are produced by the cells below, which are the stratum spinosum. So we're always going more superficial. But here's what's really important. The cells at this layer start to produce two proteins. The first protein you want to highlight is called keratin. This was the protein I mentioned in part one. This is a tough fibrous protein that makes us water resistant. The second protein is what actually gives the layer the grainy appearance is called keratohyalin. These granules actually help to cross link the keratin fibers, actually bring the keratin fibers closer together and making us more water resistant. The other thing that the keratin hyaline does is that it uh, makes us makes the cells dehydrated and that actually causes the cells to die. So what's important also is that the stratum granulosum, this is the layer where we actually go from having living skin cells to dead skin cells. Okay, so some of the highlights of the stratum granulosum again, three to five layers of dead keratinocytes. The two proteins that you want to know are going to be the keratin, right? That's what makes us water resistant. And the keratohyalin is the uh, protein that actually brings the keratin fibers together, right? Making them nice and tightly together, and then also promoting dehydration of the cells so that the cells die. The fourth layer is the stratum lucidum. So the, this is called lucid means clear. So the cells actually appear clear when you look at them under the microscope. This is a layer that's only found in thick skin, right? We're not going to see this in thin skin. So they're going to be on top of the stratum granulosum, right? They're more superficial. At this point, if you looked at the cells under the microscope, they would appear flat. Right, you're going to see relatively few organelles. I put here no organelles. And the cells at this point are filled with keratin so that the cells are completely water resistant. The most superficial layer is the stratum corneum. Right? This is the tough layer. So they call it the horny layer, meaning that it has kind of a toughness to it. If you were to touch your skin, this is what you're touching. You're touching the stratum corneum. So this is the exposed surface of the skin. At this point, we're water resistant. And you could see it's a much thicker layer. It has anywhere from 15 to 30 layers of dead keratinized cells. I didn't use this term before, but the process of making us water resistant is known as keratinization, right? So this is the formation of these protective layers of, of the cells that are filled with keratin, right? So you may hear that term keratinization. Now, how long does it take from cells to get from the stratum basale to the stratum corneum. It's about a week. Figure seven to ten days. So when the cells are first made at the stratum basale, it takes a week to get to the stratum corneum. And they'll stay, the cells will stay in your stratum corneum for another two weeks, right? And then they'll shed off. But again, the good news is we have new cells from the stratum basale constantly replacing our sloughed off cells. Now, we can lose water from the, uh, the epidermis, or the, through the stratum corneum actually, by uh, something known as insensible perspiration. Right? So we think of perspiration, we think of sweating, but this is a type of water loss that's not sweating. 
we actually lose water because the water actually diffuses across the stratum corneum and evaporates from the skin. So we're actually losing water through our dead skin cells, right? We roughly use lose about 500 milliliters per day. If you just want to add there, that's about a pint. But since it's over the whole surface of your skin, you can't sense it. You don't feel that water loss, right? You don't feel the loss of that pint of water over the whole surface area of your body. So that's why they call it insensible. We cannot sense that. Opposed to sensible perspiration, this is what we typically think about when we lose water by the sweat glands, right? If you go to the gym today and you go on the treadmill, you start working out and you start to sweat and you feel sweat on your forehead or on your chest, that type of thing. You sense that sweat. That's the sweat we lose through the sweat glands that we call sensible perspiration. Right? So insensible perspiration, we cannot sense. We lose about a pint of water through the skin every day. Uh, last thing here I didn't talk about yet. If there's damage to the stratum corneum, then the rate of insensible perspiration is going to be lost because we're going to lose more water because there's less skin at, at, at a certain point. Uh, an example of that would be from a burn, right? So if you burn the skin, uh, it's not going to be there to, to really keep the water in. So the rate of water loss will be increased by insens insensible perspiration if you damage the stratum corneum. All right, so insensible perspiration, you can't feel it. We lose about a pint of water a day. Sensible perspiration, as you know, right, as a way of cooling, we can feel that type of sweat. So we call that sensible. So before we go to the last slide, I just want to show you again here on the um, martini picture, here's the five layers. They do a good job with this. So here they're describing the layers just like I just did. And you can see here, so this bottom layer would be the stratum basale. Here's an epidermal ridge. Oh, this is stratum basale. Then these cells here are going to be the stratum spinosum. The darker area, stratum granulosum. Right? If you looked at these cells at a higher magnification, they would appear grainy. Then just above it, this clear line right here, this is thick skin, we're seeing a little bit of it. This would be the stratum lucidum, right? only found in thick skin. And then look at this thickest layer here, all these sheets and sheets of flat dead cells is the stratum corneum. Right? So these slough off every day at the top. But again, the good news is we make new ones down here. And again, it takes about a week to get to the stratum corneum and then these cells will stay here for about two weeks. So Martini does a pretty good job with that but the picture I really like is from the Tortora book. They um, they do a really good job with this because you just see the cells so well. So again stratum basale, these are your stem cells, right, the basal cells. Stratum spinosum, right here and here you can actually see one of the uh, dendritic cells like the Langerhans cells right here. Then the next one, stratum granulosum. And if you can, you can see the little grains in there now, the little granules. That's the keratohyalin. Then in thick skin, the clear layer, stratum lucidum. And then the stratum corneum. And so they, that, that diagram is really, really good. They do a good job with that. The last thing that we want to talk about on the epidermis is about some chemicals that stimulate the um, growth of epidermis. Now, we don't just see epithelial cells on our skin. As we go through our studies, we're going to see epithelial cells lining all of our organ systems, like our intestines and things like that. So we have epithelium all over the body. So um, th there's a, these growth factors will affect these uh, epi ep uh, epithelial cells also. But as far as the skin, we have these growth factors called EGFs, epidermal growth factors. They're a protein chemical. Uh, what's interesting is they're produced by the salivary glands and then a small or first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. 
um, that's where they're produced. Uh, in labs where they treat people with burns, they actually use these chemicals to grow skin grafts so that they can put artificial skin onto a, a, a burn victim. So what do these EGFs do? These are these chemicals that keep the basal cells producing new cells. Those stem cells continually uh, reproduce. They accelerate keratin production, again the waterproofing protein. Uh, if we have an injury they stimulate repair of the epidermis and they actually stimulate glandular secretions. And we'll talk about the different glands as we go through uh, this uh, integumentary system. All right, so those are the features of the epidermis. In part three, we'll take a look at the dermis.